said, no, who are you? She said, I am the wife of the speaker. He said, oh, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, well, thank the Lord, I'm leaving. <laughs> Did I use up three minutes? Oh, no. No? Let's see. <laughs> Y'all don't mind if we start about a minute early. Is that okay? We start about a minute early, y'all? We'll just, you know, I, I, I know we need to be true to our time because we've got like 100 and about 120 registered. Huh? Okay. Well, if, if, it's, if it's okay, since this is Christian pairs, then I figured since we're, you're here because you're a Christian to learn about the faith-based version, I personally would like to open in prayer. So let's do that. Father? Thank you for the opportunity to come here, Lord, and for Smart Marriages, which unites all of us, Father, under the banner of wanting healthier marriages and stronger families, Lord, not just for our kids, but, Lord, for us as well, because I know I want it for myself. And I ask, Father, that uh, all those who are here, the brothers and sisters you've sent here today, that we might be uh, um, um, energized, that we might be encouraged in our own marriages, but also in the ministries you call us to, in the service, Father, you've called us to. And that, Father, we might learn a little bit more about your heart and about your word, and Father, just about pairs and how it could help us strengthen marriages and families in our own communities. I thank you, Father, for Lori and her heart and all that she's learned all these years that she can pass on to us, Father, in, in the house of faith so that we can go strengthen marriages and families, Lord, and do your will. It's in your name I pray for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon. It is good to, to have you here. I am uh, Dr. Richard Marks, but I go by Rick. I have PhDs and MA and an MA, but that just means I'm an overachiever. That's all that means. Um, I do what I do because not of my degree. I do what I do because I came from brokenness. I always like to tell the story and introduce myself. My father's side of the family, my great-grandfather, Marx, was a Russian Jew. And uh, the Marxes were Jewish. <clears throat> but my grandmother, no, excuse me, my great-grandfather, my mother's side, he was a devout Muslim. He was born in Lebanon. You want to know why I'm weird? That's it. But things get bizarre. The first Persian Gulf War was difficult because I didn't know where I wanted Scud missiles dropping. It's like Iraq, Jerusalem, I wasn't really sure. But when I was born, um, I was baptized Catholic. Go figure. <laughs> Parents divorced when I was three. My, the Marxists had my mother put away in a psychiatric hospital for six months. Dad got all of us. He married my stepmother, and we were raised as Unitarians. Weird, weird. I'm just ecumenical. And at age 17, living in a little town in North Georgia, a little town called Powder Springs, uh, I dated a girl named Lori, I mean, uh, Lisa. And Lisa, there was something different about her family. And it was through that family that uh, I came to know the Lord as my Savior. And soon thereafter, the Lord called me to ministry. I thought that meant I was going to be a preacher. Went in the Navy as a chaplain's assistant, and from there... I realized my calling was more in the helping field and strengthening marriage and families, but I do it a lot of it because my wife and I came from brokenness, and we decided we are not going to pass on the legacy and the generational curses that we came from. It is going to change. <clears throat> Part of that process in healing for me has come in many different ways, but one of the big ways for me has been through many of the programs that you learn here and very specifically through pairs and so you will learn a little bit about it but this is a master teacher session and I am not the master I am nothing more than a servant of the master and so I would like to introduce to you the founder of pairs and the lady who has taught me much not just as a therapist but also about relationships in a way that I never really understood them even as a therapist Dr. Lori Gordon. Lori? I love you. So I thought I'd tell you what drew me to Richard. A few years ago at Smart Marriages, I was teaching peers, which is the youth program. And uh, Richard was one of the people in the class. And every time I did an exercise, I would hear this voice say, wow, I could put that in my prep program. And then I would do another one. And I would hear, wow, that'll go in my prep program. Well, then we got to the lunch break. 
and we had our various manuals on a table. One of them was prepares for Christian marriage. And Rick picks it up and he sort of looks at it, scornfully throws it down. He says, I could do better than that. So I said, well, take it and do it. And he did. He did. So Rick is now our director in the state of Florida for developing Christian marriage. And he co-authored the 10 session Christian marriage book, which we do have somewhere here. But I thought I would tell you what else drew me to Rick. It was his energy, his enthusiasm, his knowledge of scripture, where every time I opened my mouth, he would say, well, that's in Genesis whatever. I thought, wow. And then it was his humor. And when I thought about humor, I realized that one thing about Rick, he's never dull. He is never dull. And you heard my story about the man who said, you know, I'm leaving. So I thought I'd tell you about uh, another speaker who was giving a talk with a very large audience. And at the end of the talk, a woman comes up to him and says, sir, I want you to know that was the worst talk I have ever heard in my life. And his host felt terrible. And the host said to him, please, don't pay any attention to that woman. She repeats everything she hears. <laughs> so now, another woman comes up to him and says, sir, that was the best talk I have ever heard. I wonder, will it be published? And he says offhandedly, he says, well, maybe posthumously. And she said, oh, I hope that soon. So, on that note, I'm going to give you back to the inspiration of Christian Pears. Thank you. This couple uh, represents the couples you see at church. They represent the people uh, that you see a lot. Uh, you know, it's funny. Couples get in, they're, you know, they, they argue and bicker trying to get the kids in the car, but the marriages aren't real happy. Because you know the evangelical divorce rates are actually the same as the unchurched. So let's be real honest, we're not doing it any better as evangelicals than they are. And we wonder why they don't listen to us. Because we're just as broken as they are. And so I think the church has to, make, has to make a really dynamic paradigm shift in what we're doing in terms of relational ministry. And um, so this is that typical couple that you see at church all the time. Now you know when you get in the car, you're arguing, bickering, right, on the way to church. And I told my wife, we're actually digging up all the carpet, and we actually went and I dug up some of the concrete at church because I found out something about concrete at church. It's magical because you're arguing, bickering when you get to church, but as soon as you step on the concrete, whoosh! Hi there, brother. It's good to see you. Man, praise God. This is, yeah, this is my wife. Oh, don't you look lovely today? And then when you take your feet off the concrete to go home, the tension's back again. You see what I mean? And so it must be the concrete. It's all it could be. But this is a typical couple. They get married, they're, they're dating, and this is what they look like. But they're congruent inside and out. But we all know how relationships work, don't we? You don't always stay this way. You know, on the inside, you start, you do things that hurt each other. You do things that, that, uh, that create pain, right? You may be insensitive. You may be neglectful. But all those little things create what? Pain on the inside. So you may not look like, you may look like this on the inside, on the outside, but on the inside, it becomes a disconnect, a sense that things are not right, okay? Now, if we do the good things consistently in relationship, then we can get back here. Are you with me? But if we don't do the good things in relationship, you could stay here for a long time. But let me submit to you that the longer you stay here, the longer you stay here, something is going to happen to that relationship. And it's basically this. It will die. The relationship will die. You can stay legally married. Or you can stay a deacon. Or you can stay a senior pastor. But let's be honest. The intimacy in the relationship is what? Dead. Now here's the good news. The dog will live. That dog... <laughs> makes it all the way through. For, for dog animal lovers, it, things work well for you. And so what I want you to understand is, is, is you begin to think about relationships. I, I want to take us back for a minute and, and do something that I learned a long time ago. Um, and this is my wife, by the way. 
we've been married 20 years this past February. They are the best 20 years of her life. And she's been a very fortunate woman to have me. She's raised me well. And, but I will tell you this to you. I, I have not been an easy husband. There's a man sitting right over there. I went through a four-half-day marriage intensive and years ago. I think it was 1998. And I realized something through that four-and-a-half-day marriage intensive. I did not earn the right to comfort my wife. I did not earn the right to comfort her pain because of the insensitivity that I had. And I swore from that weekend on, I will earn that right back. Do whatever it takes because I do not want to fail her in those areas. And so I show you this because I will share stories about me and her. She knows the stories that I share, but I want you to see the woman who has inspired me and, and helped me become what I am today. By the way, this is the difference between men and women. There are differences, you know. I'm sure you can relate to this, guys, right? <laughs> you know? The mission is go to Gap, buy a pair of pants. <laughs> guys, we just go there and get it. <laughs> Ladies, you spend a lot more time and a lot more money to get there. <laughs> that is a gender difference, wouldn't you agree? There is another gender difference. This one speaks to itself. It's a gender difference. Uh, there's differences. The only problem, ladies, is this. We have no earthly idea what those knobs do until we touch them. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Turn that one back. Turn that one back. Now, you know, before you got married, let's be honest, he was tall, he was strong, he stood up for you, he spoke his mind. That was, prior, that was pre marriage. Matter of fact, it happens in the animal kingdom as well. You find animals out there, you'll see that before they really get together, he's strong, he's protective. I mean, he's there for his lady, just like you were when you were dating. However, marriage has amazing transformation, even in the animal kingdom. We, we all know that it's a married couple right there. So um, we would call that a placator and a blamer in our work. You know, don't, I don't want to deal with it, honey, whatever you want. You know, just don't want to deal with it. So, I want you to think about something for a minute here. And, and uh, I learned this, but it's a wonderful little tool. If you could think about paradise, just think about paradise for a minute. If you could have paradise however you would want it, what would it look like? What kind of stuff would you want there? And what would you do there? So just kind of think about it. Would it be on a mountain? Uh, would it be on a, on a uh, beach somewhere out in the, you know, tropics? I did this once at a, in a Paris conference, and this lady, her, her paradise was a house that she knew of way back in the jungles of uh, Puerto Rico. It is a big house that has no walls. It is just a one huge roof. Animals walk through it. It even has a grand piano in it. And I thought, wow. But that was paradise to her. Mine, I will tell you. It is a huge log cabin with a big, huge stone fireplace. I will have a Dodge Ram pickup, extended cab, Roll bars, lights, winch, everything like that. I said this once in a church in Detroit, not knowing they were all Ford employees. <laughs> I flew home early that weekend. <clears throat> Thought I could say it'd be a Ford truck. It'd be something like that. And, and, and I would want that. Of course, I want a lot. I'm a big American history nut. I would do a lot of things, computer games, that kind of stuff I would have. But just for a minute, just one or two people, what would your paradise be if you could have it? What would it be? Somebody. Huh? Close to water, like a lake, ocean, or what? Yes, just doesn't matter. Yet yeah, lake, ocean, just close to water. Okay. What kind of stuff would you have? Then what would you do there? You would rest. Okay. Someone else. Yes. Okay, a mountainside horse ranch with barns and a huge barn for his vehicles. Okay, you could think about whatever, whatever your paradise would be. Just kind of think about it for a minute. Get a sense of what it would be like to think about that. I'm sure you would not have taxes there, weeds, those kind of things. Now, you get everything you want in paradise, but here's something I want to play with you for a minute. And then tell me if you take the deal. I'm going to give you three things. And then tell me if you would take paradise the way you could imagine it. So you get paradise the way you want it. You get everything you want there. You get to do whatever you want. And the first part of the deal, and by the way, my parts of the deal are non-negotiables. All right? So if part of my part of the deal is, uh, goes against something you have there, then you have to give yours up. All right? 
minor non-negotiables. So the first one is, paradise would be the way you want it. You'd get the stuff you want there. You get to do what you want to do there. And here's the first one. You get to be in charge. Would you take it? Would you? I would. You know, I get to be in charge of my paradise? That sounds pretty good to me. I'd take it. Second non-negotiable. God is going to be in paradise with you. The Father himself. Would you take it? Sound pretty good so far? I'd take it. Sounds good to me. Third non-negotiable. No one else is allowed with you. No? Why not? You get paradise, everything you want, be in charge, God's going to be there with you. Let me tell you something. You were not created to take it. I have these old redneck boys, a lot of you from the south, you know rednecks. You know what? It comes right down to it. All I need is God. And I go, wow, that sounds spiritual, that sounds marvelous. By the way, answer a question for me. If that's okay for you to only need God and you live in a fallen world, why was it not okay for Adam? He lived in paradise. He was with God. He was not alone. You see, the problem Adam had was when God showed up and said, Adam, it's not good that you should be what? Alone. Adam was not alone. He was with who? So how can you be with God in paradise and alone at the same time? So I submit to you that we were created needy. We are biologically needy, right? You need food, air, water. We'll talk more about this in regards to the relationship roadmap in a minute. We need those things. But you are also created spiritually needy, and we are created relationally needy. See, Adam needed more relationship than just God. If you don't like that, take that up with him. He made us to not need him only. He made us to need him and who? Other people. Does that make sense? We are created needy. And if in our relationships we do the good things, then those needs will be met. And the thing about needs are, if needs are not met, something dies. Are you with me? If y'all don't eat, and you can tell I don't have a problem there, but if I don't eat for a long time, what's going to happen to me? You're going to die. Oh, by the way, in a Christian worldview, if your needs uh, and spiritually are not met in the appropriate way, there will be death, what you call spiritual death, right? By the way, as we saw in the picture, if the needs of the human soul to bond, to connect are not met, over time, there will be a relational death as well. There will be a death inside. Have you ever heard of the story, of uh, the video they show teachers called Cyber in the Snow? Did you ever see any teachers? About a little boy that dropped dead, true case, dropped dead at a bus stop. And they didn't know why. There was no physiological reasons for him to die until they started pouring in his school records. They began to realize way back in, problems in the family. This kid was so deeply alone, he just gave up on life. It's the only conclusion they could make. We are created to, be, to, to connect, to bond. Does that make sense? Now, so Adam's dilemma was basically this. He's in a perfect environment. He possesses everything. He's got an exalted position, and he's with who? God. And yet God said it's not good that man should be what? Alone. Now you think about it. Adam had no idea what that meant. So God tells him right after Genesis 2.18, it's not good that you should be alone. I'm going to make a help me for you. Adam goes, cool. I understand what you don't know what that means, but that's all right. So then Adam starts naming the animals. You know, it's like... Dog, dogus, bear, bearus, hmm, hippo, hippoist. Hey, God, yeah, Adam, I'm naming all these animals, and um, something don't seem right. What is it? I don't know. Well, keep naming them. And the scripture says, in the process of naming the animals, Adam comes to realization. What was it? That there was not another one, what? Like him. At the moment, Adam realized that there was not another one like him. What do you think he felt? Alone. Alone. Human aloneness existed before the fall. You must get that. The remedy to aloneness was relationship with God and others. Does that make sense? And what I found, what I found in my thinking theologically that I never knew that I did not have were the skills to get people how to maintain that first picture of that couple. Because I hear I am as a therapist, and I'm trying to help people get back to it, but I don't know how to get them because I'm doing too much therapy. And the therapy was getting in the way. But I, didn't know, no, I did not know that I did not know that I needed to teach skills because most people didn't know how to get there. And then when I found pairs, what I realized and what I was believing and had learned theologically, relationally, I realized that I needed the skills to help people get there and stay there. 
Does that make sense? And that's what I needed. Because I had the relational principles down. I knew how to get people to experience Bible verses. But what I did not know, what I did not know is I needed to teach them the skills on how to maintain that. Does that make sense? Now, we call early in our work, the, the Lori defined what she called the relationship roadmap. I'm going to give it back to Lori because it's, it's hers. But the, here's how the relationship roadmap essentially works. Is that we are created to bond. And Lori will pick this up here in a minute as she talks about confiding. But we are created to bond. We are created to connect to others. And that if our needs are met, we will feel a sense of happiness, a sense of love, a sense of pleasure. Does that make sense? If those needs are met in our hearts, we will feel a greater sense of ease, a greater sense of trust. We will have a greater sense of pleasure, desire, and love. How many people would rather be on the pleasure side of the road map? I don't know about you, but I would. You got it? Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve, that's all they knew. After the fall, they went to the pain side of the road map. Okay? And this is what we call the logic of emotion, the logic of love. That you either feel pleasure or you feel what? Pain. Most people will spend their life on the pain side of the road map. What I want to do is help people learn how to stay on the pleasure side of the road map and teach them the skills to keep them there. So signs of happiness of people who stay on this side of the road map, there's a greater sense of health, energy, well-being, flexibility, creativity, sense of openness, sharing. They take personal responsibility, and there's a capacity for intimacy. I grew up as a very insecure young man. I did not know what love was because it was never really given to me. For me, love was jump hurdles. So now I have an MA, an MA, a PhD, an LPC, an LMFT, CIA, UFO, EI, EIO. <laughs> All of, yeah, an ESPN. <laughs> but, the, but the reality is basically this. When I got my degree and I walked across that stage, the first thought I had is, what's next? Now, what's next? Because I could not, I could not, for me, acceptance and love was jumping hurdles. I lived on the pain side, of the pleasure, uh, pain side of the road map. And I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I wanted to do something different. Because I wanted a di different legacy for my wife, for me, and for my kids especially. People who live on the pain side of the road map always, road map, always have a greater sense of dis-ease, distrust, distrust. They have more pain, a sense of danger, fear, and anger. And there are the symptoms there. Illness, fatigue, depression, rigid personality. To be more constricted, isolated, closed, guarded, weary. Antisocial behaviors develop and addictions develop. Why addictions? You've got to medicate the what? Pain. Genesis 2.18 says something rather interesting. Leave, no, not 2.18, Genesis 2.24. Leave, cleave, become what? One flesh, right? What is one flesh? Let's say I give you a definition of one flesh. You could walk out of here today and say, oh, I just learned what one flesh is. And you could quote it and feel proud that you quote it. Paul says knowledge puffs up, but what edifies? Love edifies. It doesn't matter how much you know. What matters more to me is not that you do you know the scripture, is are you living it out? Don't be hearers of the word only, but what? Doers of the word. So let's say you knew what one flesh meant. That's okay. I have a bigger question for you. How would you know it if you had it? How would you know it? So just take for a few minutes. How would you know if you had one flesh? I will give you a more contemporary term. See, I think the most important part of your marriage isn't the husband and it isn't the wife. It's this third party. And for a minute, I'm just going to put God out of the equation. This third party is the party that will even lost people do this sometimes better than we do, according to some of the data. They do this really good. See, the most important part of your marriage isn't you, it isn't your wife, it isn't me, it isn't Luella. It's us. Us is the most important part of marriage. And if all of my decisions are based on what is best for us, I win, she wins, because it takes two to make it, one to kill it. Now, if I make all of my decisions based on what's best for what? Us, I will actually do strange things like die to self. For her, no, for us. I, I will actually humble myself. I will actually set, uh, what's this verse, uh, esteem others more highly than myself. Why? For the sake of us. Us wins, I win. Every night, I want three people in that bedroom. Me, her, and us. Because I'm going to tell you something, folks. There are Christian people. There's him and her, but there is no us. Us went a long time ago. You know what I mean? I remember the time my wife and I were fighting, and us went out the door. I think we went out in the yard and played. And I went downstairs, huffing and puffing. You could feel the tension in the house. And I was down there 30 minutes playing computer games. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You teach this stuff. Get back up there. My goal was not to get up there and be right because I knew I was right. 
in this argument. And I knew I was right. But my goal wasn't to be right. My goal was to get what back? Us back. And so I went up there and I said, you can feel the tension, can't you? She said, yep. I said, you know why it's there? She said, yep, because you think you're right. I said, no, I know I'm right, but you know you're right. But look, why don't we just agree to disagree? It isn't worth fighting over at the expense of what? Us. Us is the most important part of your marriage. And the only way you know you got us in your marriage, it's really easy, but most people can't figure it out, is you'd feel it. You can feel us when it's around. And by the way, you can feel us when it ain't around. Right? Now, the funny thing about us is this. Us is actually different than me. I'll give you an example. That picture of that mall, it's me. You do not see me. It is not in and of me to go to malls. I don't know about you men, but I find most men understand this. We go to malls for one reason. Go to that store, get that object, and get out of there. Ladies go and can walk around for hours. That's okay, but it is not in and of me. You know what I mean, men? Okay, ladies, you got it? It's not in and of most men. It's not a, this guy doesn't do it. However, even though I don't like the mall, us likes the mall. Us, us will go to the mall any day. Because when us goes to the mall, I'm not there. Does that make sense? It ain't me, it's us. Because when us goes, we're holding hands and we're talking, we're dreaming. Us will go anytime. But I won't. Does that make sense? Us is different. Don, I've not convinced us to play paintball yet, but I'm working on it. But the skills to keep us, the skills to keep us, what I learned, were actually in confiding, opening up, and sharing. And so I want to turn it over to Lori now to talk about the roadmap and what it means to confide. You really are terrific. Very <clears throat> hard to follow him. Um, so I heard your story, and I was thinking about me and us and all that stuff, and I want to introduce my husband who's sitting back there of 22 years. Morris, if you would stand up. He's the reason you heard about us, because he's the extrovert, and I'm really the introvert. But I want to tell you that I grew up singing love songs. Some enchanted evening, you know, stuff like that. My hero, someday my prince will come. Uh, and I thought that's what life would be. I thought you fall in love and you get married and you love each other and everything is fine. Well, the other thing that happened for me at about six is that my father taught me to play chess on his knee. And it developed my logical thinking part. He validated my ability to think and to solve puzzles. And then somewhere along the way, in my teens, from 14 to 16, seven people died in my family very quickly. My father died of a coronary. He was 54. My mother died of cancer. She was 45. It was a year later. Two grandparents and three uncles. And what I learned is that you never know. You really never know. And if you don't make the most of the relationships you have when you have them, you may not have them. And what regrets will you be left with? So a lot of things happened for me in my teens about not wanting to waste the pleasure that could be there not wanting to waste the joy that can be there in relationships, and a lot of thinking about what is love and what is love about. And it probably is not hard to understand that at the age of 19, I married someone I'd known less than three months. He was a law student and I was an undergraduate. And I wonder if we have any attorneys in the room. Attorneys? Well, you know, in law school, they teach a lot about the oppositional position. They teach a lot about whatever side you're on, the attorney should take the other side because that's the way they win their cases. But it didn't work in intimacy. It didn't work in closeness. 
And so I spent a lot of time about what is closeness and what is intimacy and what is confiding and what is love about. And eventually, along the way, I went back to graduate school and I got several degrees and I decided either the marriage was going to get better or it was not going to be. And it turned out there was no one helping marriages. That was a few years ago. There were no marriage and family therapists. There was no marriage and family therapy association. Uh, there were psychoanalysts who could only meet with one person, not two people, and never did they help you talk to each other. So of course this began to gel in me in terms of what is needed in terms of relationships, and what sense can you make of what goes wrong, and what needs to happen to change it. Because in graduate school, they teach you a lot about change it, but they don't tell you how to change it. You just know that, of course, you should change things. So along the way, I got into what is love about, and what is the logic? And we came up with the logic of emotion. And what you're looking at when you look at the roadmap is basically the logic of emotion is very simple. It's the logic of pleasure and pain. And what is it that gives us pleasure or pain? At the most basic level, it's getting our biologically based needs met, such as food and air and water and shelter. Because when we don't have those things, that's all we're going to think of getting. Whatever we need to do to be able to feed ourselves and get the drinks that we need, the water, the roof over our heads. But what somehow was not included, although in listening to Rick, you know it was included. But in our Western culture, the need for emotional and physical closeness to one or more other people. And we call that need bonding. And we say bonding is a biologically based need. It's not a whim. It's not, well, it's nice if you have it. And it's unfortunate if you don't. But if you don't, we develop symptoms. And the symptoms of the inability to get our needs for closeness met are dis-ease, distress, distrust, unhappiness. We feel pain or the anticipation of pain, emotional pain. Or we anticipate danger of unhappiness and not getting our needs met. And in that state, we feel fear and we feel anger. And there are other places where we get into much of this in pairs. But the range of symptoms of unhappiness that we see in our Western culture have been related to the inability to meet our needs for closeness. And when we talk about bonding, we're talking about physical and emotional closeness. And the range of physical closeness is anywhere from affection and comfort and tenderness, and sensuality, and sex. There's a whole range. And today in our world, many of us are meeting our need for closeness with pets. One of the largest growing industries in our country, pet industry. We are trusting our puppies, and our kittens, and our birds, and our fish more with our need for closeness to something or someone more than we're trusting people. Because what we're finding is that it's so hard to be able to trust someone with our feelings. And so what we get into here is that the emotional part of bonding is what we call confiding. A simple word. Confiding, the ability to tell you what is in my heart, what is in my mind? What is it that I want? What is it that I don't want? What is it that hurts me? 
What is it that I need you to know to understand who I am? To confide in you and trust. Trust that you want to know. That's number one. Trust that you know how to listen. That you won't use it against me. That you won't ignore me. That you won't argue with me about what I think and feel. That you know how to listen with empathy. You know how to listen for understanding. And that based on that, I can confide in you. And based on my ability to listen and want to know, you can confide in me. And given that, we can fill our need, our need for emotional closeness with each other. And the heart of bonding is what intimacy is about. That when we can have that kind of emotional closeness, and when we can join it with physical closeness, then we have the oneness that Rick is saying was intended, was intended before the fall, was known about before we ever came along. Only we lost sight of it, that somehow or other, we lost the clarity that this is part of being fully human, that these are not whims. This is what it takes to have pleasure and happiness and ease and trust in our lives. And so based on this understanding, we began to develop some tools to help people confide. Because what we found is so many of us never learned how. We had no model for it. Our parents didn't do it. Maybe our parents' relationship was based on survival. Maybe that was the best they could do. Maybe that was the best they knew. But what we are looking for is to fill our needs for emotional and physical closeness with each other. We want each other to be our best friend. And how do we get there? So given that, we're going to offer you one of the simple but one of the most popular tools that were developed. We thank Virginia Satir for this one. It's called the Daily Temperature Reading. And it's on your little blue wallet card that we gave you. And if you will take a look at it and turn to the side that has five categories on it, we want to show you how it works. And then we want you to try it. And that doesn't mean that you will fall in love with each other, but you might. Because we have found that when people confide in each other, even when it's someone you never knew before, you have a sense of closeness that is a real pleasure. And so we say, well, if it's not someone you came with, even if you do feel loving, you don't have to act on it, okay? Yeah, and I, and I'd like to just uh, remind us that needs must be met. Again, if needs are not met, something what? Dies. And, this real, and, and think about it this way. She's talking about biologically based needs. Appetite is a biologically based need, right? Well, if I go eat rat poison, will that solve my need for appetite? Yes. I won't be hungry. It solved the need. This is important. You get this. I, I will solve the need. I won't be hungry. Now, I'll die. But the need was met. And there's a lot of people out there filling needs with various forms of rat poison. It's a semblance of getting the need met, but it leaves you wanting. And, and, and I'm arguing in God's commodity, relational principles, if we do it his way, then there's a greater sense of the needs being met, greater sense of usness in the relationship. Okay. There they are. There's much we could talk about. And the Pairs course is a semester-long, 120-hour course. And we get into what sabotages relationships and what would you be taking in that really, every time you take it in, you poison yourself a little bit. And what's the price of that? And how do you change it? But right now, we're going on Daily to temperature. the temperature reading. And if you look at the first one, it says appreciation. And it's saying that in a relationship that matters, 
we really have to acknowledge what we appreciate about the other. And usually what we do with the people we're closest to is we tell them our complaints. We tell them what's wrong. We tell them what we're upset about. And so this is saying we start out with what's good. And I just wanted to do this with Rick because certainly I really love listening to you. I love your stories. I love how quick you are to put all these pieces together. And I really appreciate that you sat there and talked about your prep class, but then you decided to teach pairs. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I'm going to share my appreciation, Lori. I appreciate you, and I will say the board as well, for your support for me as I've taken a new venture in my life and moved on. It, it means a lot to me. So okay. I, I want you to know okay. that. Okay. And we have some members of the pairs board, and maybe you would stand up and just let people know that Don Adams sitting here is vice president of the Pierce Foundation, and Katerina sitting next to him designed the gorgeous banners you see at our exhibit table. Stand up, stand up, stand up, come on. Yeah, she's a graphic artist. And Joe sitting next to Don is his loving support through all this time. And Ellen Purcell, who many of you may have spoken to, is our wonderful administrative director and the executive director of our youth program. So for us, it's great to have that kind of support with us. Okay, now what we want you to do is turn to someone next to you and want you to share an appreciation. And you, of course, may not know that person. If you're here with your spouse, we want you to share appreciation with them. But uh, just share something with that, that person next to you that you appreciate. It may be that you appreciate Osama bin Laden's ability to do what he does. I don't know. Well, they you can know? sit in for someone else in your life. Just find someone to do this exercise with. Be able to share an appreciation. Next. The next, part, the next thing we share, we always share an appreciation, and I will share this with you. I do this with my family. I do this as a family devotion. I, well, we may not go through all five, but I'll say, all right, everybody share an appreciation. My daughter, she's 13. I don't have one. Well, think of one. I don't have one. Think of one. I appreciate the table mats. Good, Madison. Good, good. No, next, next, next. But I want my kids to learn to confide as well. Next is new information. You want to take that? You take that. Me take that. Take New information that. has to do with the things that that have happened in our lives that our mates doesn't know that our mates don't know about. Just new information. Um, a lot of us, when we when conflict comes to relationship, we quit confiding, and when we quit confiding, we quit sharing things that have happened. You see what I mean? And so we argue, share something that that person doesn't know, because there's always things that are happening in our lives that our mates don't know about, and we argue, share one of those. Does that make sense? And so. I will share some new information with you, Lori. I would like to know. Okay. Um, I have a friend here in uh, uh, Texas who got himself in a lot of serious problems and um, lost his licenses, those kind of things, and he's paid dearly for it, but he and I have been able to connect, and we're going to be getting together on Sunday, and I'm going to be able nice. to minister to him nice. and just comfort him and just let him know I still care, even though he's gotten himself in serious trouble, but I'm excited about that. So, so I won't great. be there on Sunday night. Oh, well, that doesn't feel so good. It doesn't feel good at all. Bring him. Um, all right, so new information. I discovered last night when I was listening to Diane that Hara Murano got the award for journalism. And Hara Murano is a very dear friend from like eight or ten years back when we met at one of these meetings and it sort of became girlfriends on the internet. We would email each other at one in the morning, and I didn't know that she was gonna be here. I didn't know she got the award, and we had supper together last night. Oh, it was really neat. nice. Okay, share some new information with that partner that you've chosen today. You to have a sense of how it feels to be able to just confide in these areas, and we're going on to puzzles. 
And puzzles are questions. And what we're talking about with this temperature reading is that we recommend that you do it on a regular basis with the person or people you're closest to, even over the telephone, even over email, even long distance, and certainly in person if you can. But that relationships that matter need to be nurtured. And this is like watering a garden. So the next one is puzzles. I want to share with you a puzzle, because it is a puzzle. I sat last night, as most of us did, in that uh, discussion of the marriage movement. And I read on the list that there are 86 goals. 86 goals, uh, nine, uh, nine branches to the flower. And when I looked at it, it felt as if we would be talking for a long time. And the puzzle for me is that what we're doing here is active. What we're doing here is practical. And it's doing something now. And it's that my impulse is to do things now, to create communities now, to create connection now. And there, you know, it may be fine to have a goal of 86 points that you want to resolve, but I'm just wondering if while that's going on, if we can't come up with something such as we're doing right here, that we could do now and we could do it in our communities or do it in our neighborhoods or do it with our friends, but get the connection going to our fellow neighbors, people, family, clan, so that we are making a difference now. That's my puzzle. My puzzle shows up every time I come here. And it is this. Why can't we get the church to make a paradigm shift mm. and quit programming things and start relating to things, to mm. people? It's just a puzzle for me. I'll just leave it there. Be a little more specific. What do you mean? Mm, I'll pick on us as, as Baptists. I think that's fair because I am one so I can pick on me. We are so program oriented. We are very relationally deficit. We are very program oriented that we even program relationships and we don't do relationships well. And so I'm really puzzled as to even why my own denomination is so cognitive but very weak relationally. And if you just look at it, Baptists have higher divorce rates than everyone else. If you look at the census data, the states with the highest divorce rates are the states where the Baptists are the strongest. So I'm going, I just puzzle as why we don't get it yet. I mean, it's just a puzzle. So, just a puzzle. Anyways, um, you can tell I want to stay there because I want to see us turn around. I want to see the Father do a mighty work there. But, but it's a puzzle. So you all have puzzles as, too, puzzles as well. Turn to each and other. So just turn and share a puzzle you have. Something you wonder. Attention. Okay, if we could pause for a moment. For those of you who are here with your partner, we surely hope that you will continue this outside this room because we're limited to 90 minutes. And you could be limited to a lifetime, maybe. But yeah. this is a structure that can water the garden of your relationship. Now, we're going to skip for this moment complaints with a request for change. That's number four. We will get to that. But that's the hardest thing to listen to, our complaints. And so we're going to get to wishes, hopes, and dreams. And so for me, my wish is that next year in this time, that there will be this sense of community and connection and that kids can grow up knowing that they're safe in their neighborhood and that there are a lot of people who can watch over and be there for them and that they don't have to be worried about coming home alone as, uh, you know, what is it, lock, <laughs> latchkey kids, that there will be a sense of maybe a clan in communities 
where there can be a new sense of connection and trust. It's my wish, hope, and dream. Well, my hope that keeps coming to mind is going to show my colors, but I'm used to that, I guess. I hope the Federal Marriage Amendment passes, and I hope that we can preserve the traditional understanding of what God intended marriage to be and family to be so we can preserve society as a whole. But that's just me. Okay. Turn to each other and share your wishes, hopes, and dreams. Pause right there, and then we're going to talk about making a complaint with a request for change. And, and what I'd like to say is um, where pairs, if you compare them to other t similar programs, sometimes we get kind of lumped into, well, pairs is an active listening skills program. Actually, it is not. It has a small active listening piece. We teach emotional literacy skills. We go beyond just active listening skills. What we're giving you is some of the active listening skills piece because we can do that in a short amount of time. But PAIRS goes way beyond that because we take people into their, their family history, into genograms, and looking at their past and how that's influenced in the present. But what we're fixing to show you now is our active listening piece, which is our way of saying, here's how to make a complaint with a request for change. It is called a dialogue guide. Lori? So if you turn your card over, you will see what we call the dialogue guide and some people call a wheel because it looks a little bit like a wheel. But the truth is it's a lot more than it looks like. And so this is a series of 18 sentence stems which are an opportunity to confide about something that bothers you, something that you're not happy about, in a way that your partner can listen, where they are looking to listen to the entire piece without interrupting, without leaving, without arguing with you, until they have heard the whole thing. And for the one who's listening, you're just going to look to understand what your partner is saying, and so you're listening with empathy. And so we call it empathic shared meaning or empathic listening because the listener is very active here. In other words, if you're not listening carefully, you are going to miss what the other one said. And if you miss it, they're going to say it over. And so it could take a long time to get through this. What we have found is that for the one who's listening, you usually cannot remember more than three sentences at a time, and some of us can only remember one. And so what it is, is the one who's confiding about something they're complaining about gets to say, they're the ones who have a complaint, and are you willing to do this with me? And I say yes. And then when, if Rick is going to complain, when I think I can't remember anymore, I will stop him. And I will tell him what I think I heard. And if I heard it right, he thanks me, and he goes on. And if I didn't hear it right, he's going to fill it in so that I do get it right. And until I have heard all of it, I don't get to answer. People say, well, don't I ever get to answer? Sure, after you've heard the whole thing. And believe it or not, I have had a few people who reconciled using this because what I was told is I never felt fully heard before. So there are 18 facets of whatever the complaint is, and we want you to see how it works. And if we have time, we will try it, but Rick thinks we won't. And if we don't, then please try it outside of here, because you don't really know how well this works unless you get a chance to do it. And so, I, Rick. And I'm going to have Lori step in for my wife. This is an actual issue that years ago we worked through, so I will say it's a non-issue. And I will say that um, I will share with you her side of it after we get done, but I will demonstrate it for you. Uh, Lori, I want you to sit in for Luella. And so if you notice, you start at the top. And it says, I notice, and what's under, underneath the word notice? The word what? So I would tell her what I notice she does. If I said, 
Luella, I notice you're an imbecile. That's not a behavior. All right? That's a way to attack. All right? And so we're not going to go there. So this is how it went. Um, I'll do three, three stems at a time. Uh, really distressed couples, I may do it one at a time. But we're not distressed. So. Yeah. Uh, Yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let yeah. me stand over here then. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a whole thing called dirty fighting, but we're not going to do it now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Luella, I noticed that when I come home, uh, you have a tendency to ignore me, and I assume this means you're mad at me, and I'm wondering what it is I've done. Okay. What you're telling me is that when you come home, I have a tendency to ignore you. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, you assume it means I'm mad at you. Right. And then when that happens, you wonder what you've done. Right. I suspect for you that you're busy um, getting things ready uh, for dinner and for the evening. Uh, however, on the other hand, I believe for me that it's important that I at least get acknowledged. She suspect about me that I'm busy. Yeah, you want to put that there. I'm busy maybe getting dinner ready, but you believe for you that it really is important to you that you're acknowledged. Yes. I do resent coming home and not getting acknowledged, and I'm puzzled by why you wouldn't want to. I mean, we love each other, and I'm actually hurt by the fact that I do get ignored. So you resent my not acknowledging you. You're puzzled by why I don't, and the truth is it hurts you. Yes. I regret, um, honey, that this is even an issue that we're talking about. I remember in the past when we did, when we were married early on and I did come home, you were there, you did acknowledge, you used to come and give me a hugs and stuff, and I'm frustrated by how I can show you that that is still important to me. So you regret even having to talk about this, mm -hmm. and, and you remember that there was a time in the past when I did greet you lovingly, and I did show you I was glad to see you, and you're frustrated by that not happening. Right, and what you see from me, what I do is I withdraw, and then I cop an attitude, and that's what you get from me. So what I see from you is that you withdraw. Uh -huh. And you said, I think you mean that you get a chip on your shoulder. Chip on my shoulder, cop an attitude, I walk around, I'm gruff, I'm, you know, uh -huh. critical. Yeah. And you just are not very nice. No, you noticed. I'm, I'm happier when I do come home and I am acknowledged. So what I would like and what we say here is very specific behavioral requests. What is it do I want? I said, what I want is when I come home, for you to at least stop for me, just for a second, look me in the eye, say, hey, honey, Rick, whatever, it's good to see you, and maybe give me a hug or a kiss. So you're happier that when you do feel acknowledged, when you come home, mm -hmm. and what you really want is that whatever I'm doing, that I stop, uh -huh. and I greet you, and maybe I hug you or I kiss you, but I, even if it's for a brief time, yeah, that's all I, I stop what I'm doing, and I welcome you. Yes. Now, I expect, well, that this will help us by allowing me to sense that everything's okay and feel welcome, and at the same time, give you freedom from all of my copying and attitude. Uh, you expect this will help us by you will be a lot happier, and it will give me freedom from that attitude where yes. you're copying an attitude. Right. I appreciate um, the fact that you are a stay-at-home mom. I appreciate the fact that you homeschool the kids. I appreciate the fact that you are getting things ready for the evening. And I do realize I am asking you to do something different. You appreciate I have a lot to do. Yes. And I'm busy with the kids, and I'm busy getting ready for the evening, and I'm busy straightening the house, and I'm busy doing all kinds of things. And you realize that this is not an easy thing for me to do, but it's really what you want. Yes. Uh, and I hope that through this change, uh, things go better for both of us, and we both feel more loved, and there's a lot more closeness uh, in the evenings. So you hope that I really listen to what you said and make the change 
and that things would be a whole lot better for us. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, yes. I'm glad you told me all Thank that. You. I didn't know it meant that much to you. Yes. However, okay. it did not go that way. <laughs> I wish it did. Rather quickly, she said, now I said my piece. She followed the skill. She says, okay, I would like to give you my piece. I said, fine. I became the listener. And hers went something like this. I noticed that when you come home, you expect me to stop what I am doing. I assume this means you don't respect the fact that I am getting things ready for you to come home, and I wonder why you put pressure on me to stop. I suspect for you it is important that you get acknowledged when you come home. However, on the other hand, I believe for me it's important that I can get to a stopping point where I can give you that attention. I resent being pressured to give it to you, and I'm puzzled by why you don't give me that freedom to love you in the way that I want to. I am hurt by the fact that I'm being pushed to do it, and I regret too, Rick, that this is an issue. By this time, the Spirit of God is already convicting me. <laughs> she went on to say, I remember the past when this was not an issue because I had that freedom to love you, and I'm frustrated by how I can let you know that I want to love you on my terms, not on your terms. What you see from me then is I withdraw, and I get hurt, and I push you away. I'm happier when I have the ability to get to a stopping point and love you and, 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 and deal with our relationship. What I'd like from you is to let me get to a stopping point since I never know when you are coming home and allow me to approach you in a way that I can give to you, not where I'm being forced to. Rick, I expect this will help you by getting your needs met and give me the freedom to love you as I want to. I appreciate the fact that you, are, that you do love me, you do care that, about this issue, and I realize I'm asking you to be patient. And then she went on to hope. And by this time, I said, whatever you want to do is fine with me because God had already showed me I was out of line. So, but you get a sense of what it does? Because one of the things that I liked about it um, was that it, it took you to the hidden issue real quick. That's what I loved about this. It went, it, you took from the presenting problem to the deeper issue because it takes you there rather quickly. And, of course, in the pairs model, we teach you a lot more that, that goes on behind it through the dirty fighting techniques that we do, either passive or, or, uh, um, or uh, overt ones. So there's a lot more to what we do. So, but this is, this is how we make a complaint with a request for change. If you have to problem solve, we, that we teach the fair fight for change skill. We actually then teach couples how do you actually resolve the problem once you've discussed it. Um, and so this is a lot of, these are some of the things that we do. Now, in the short amount of time that I have, if you want to say anything, I'll go finish up. Well, I just wanted to say how difficult it is to listen to the whole thing, and yet that's what we're saying. Listen to the whole thing. Don't argue. Don't walk away. Don't contradict. Really hear it, and then you will have a chance to respond. And what you heard from Rick is that he didn't get the response he wanted which can also happen, but I was struck with how many times the entry into the home is an issue, that whoever's coming home really wants to be welcomed, and whoever's there doesn't really want to be interrupted, and how much misunderstanding there can be, because there's another part that we call emotional allergy, where they're each allergic to what the other one is doing, and they trigger each other. And, and so what we do about that, that's... All yeah, and, th and that's more into the pairs. When we, when we do some of these skills, I mean, you're actually doing Ephesians 4 by speaking the truth, what? In love. Because you're owning it for yourself. James says, be slow to anger, quick to hear, slow to. You're doing those verses when you do these skills. And I always found out if you do the word, it'll work. If you don't do the word, it'll get you that too. So if you want something to keep you on the, pain, the pleasure side of the road, Matt, do the word. If you would want to stay on the pain side of the road, Matt, don't do it. I found out it was that simple. Let me just say something, though. This can be misused. It takes oh, yes. goodwill. And so each of us has to look to bring goodwill to it in behalf of the relationship. So you could say, I notice that you're an insensitive clod. I assume that means you don't care at all about me. Uh, I wonder why I even married you. I mean, it can be misused. And so it's very important 
that we bring goodwill to confiding and to the listening. I'll just show you real quick, Lori brought up the issue of emotional allergies, and those are intense allergic reactions. In one piece, in pairs, we talk about the triune brain, the feeling brain, the thinking brain, and the survival brain. And what I have included in my uh, lectures with Christian pairs is this right here. And we talk about those intense emotional reactions we get. And sometimes we in the church don't realize that emotions are nothing, mo nothing more than neurological, neuro neurochemical reactions in your brain. And so all emotions are generated in what we call the limbic system, which is this piece right up here on uh, uh, this side of the... Um, this is actually a male brain, a guy who had an anger problem. So that's what anger looks like right here on the left. Now the front part of the brain right around here is called the cortex. This is where all thinking takes place. You notice that he's not thinking a lot, but he's a lot of feeling, isn't he? Well, the Bible says be slow to what? And, no, 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 be angry and what? Sin not. Do you understand in order to do that, you've got to make a shift in your brain. You've got to be able to go from your limbic brain to your cortex, which is a thinking brain. Five-minute intervention with this gentleman here. Look what part of the brain he's using. He'll make much better decisions as long as he functions there. You with me? But sometimes, Lori talked about emotional allergies. Things that our mates do trigger emotional memory. That's what it looks like. I go, hey, it's okay if you're angry. But when you feel that reaction, you better stop, step back, think it through, make a better decision. I'll give you an example. My wife or I sitting on the bed one morning. We were arguing. Us had left the room again. I knew I was right. She knew she was right. And all of a sudden, this feeling just went through my body, and this thought said, you are just like your mother, my mother. And then this, and this is no joke. This other thought said, why don't you enlighten her? And so I looked at her, and I was fixing to tell her, you're just like my mom. She's still talking. I'm not listening. This other thought jumped into my head. It was my cortex. It said, look at her. So I looked at her. And that thought said, does she look like your mother? No. Now, Luella had no idea what's going on in my head. Is she as old as your mother? No. Did she always act like your mother? No. Is she your mother? No. Keep it to yourself. <laughs> had I enlightened her, we'd probably still be arguing about it today. Does that make sense? And so we talk about those, those reactions that we get. And then we have exercises in, in Christian pairs that show you where they come from. Where in your past and who are they really about? Because a lot of times we don't know. And we want to keep those past issues that are tied up in emotional memory, I want to keep those out of my present relationship. Does that make sense? And so we actually have exercises to help you identify where those reactions are coming from. And then one thing that I insisted on as we close our lecture today before we take questions is I wanted a forgiveness piece. I wanted a piece on forgiveness. And, and it's important to me because when you go through an experience like this, I believe the Spirit of God is going to show you where you have hurt your mate, where you were wrong. And, and, and it's the, nowhere in the Scripture are we told to say, I'm sorry. We are told to seek forgiveness, to admit that we are wrong, and to say, will you what? Forgive me. And I believe that we need to not, not just talk about forgiveness, we need to practice forgiveness. If nations would practice forgiveness, we'd have a whole lot of healing going on. But we in the church aren't even doing it well in our own marriages. And forgiveness is crucial because it's the very thing that we receive from our theology. We were forgiven of the greatest sin debt, right? And who are we to not forgive? And so we end with a, we end with a, um, a, a, a lecture on forgiveness. And I talk about what forgiveness is and what it is not rather quickly. Forgiveness is not reconciliation, not necessarily. You can forgive someone, doesn't mean you be reconciled to them. Because forgiveness is about who I am. It's not about the relationship. If you can forgive your offender, but they don't care whether you're forgiven, they may hurt you still. Forgiveness is not about the relationship, it's about you. Secondly, forgiveness is not forgetting. You hear it in the church, well, forgive and forget. Well, I prove that's wrong. You can be sexually abused for 15 years. Is it possible to forgive your offender? Yes. Believe me, forgiveness doesn't make you have a frontal lobotomy. You can still remember you were what? You'll still remember you were abused. It doesn't take away memory. Someone's thinking, well, yeah, well, God says forgive and forget. As far as he forgives and forgets. No, it doesn't. He says he forgives and remembers no more. There's a big difference. You don't think about forgetting. You just what? Forget. But you do choose to not bring up an issue once you've let it lie. You choose to not remember something. You got it? 
Forgiveness doesn't also mean condoning. It doesn't mean that we condone what was done. It doesn't mean that. Some people think, well, if I forgive them, it means what they did was right. No, they were still wrong. Forgiveness so you can be let go. You know, John 10.10 10 talks about abundant life. Now, I'm going to argue abundant life. You know, the thief comes to rob, steal, destroy. But I have come to have life and life more what? Abundant. And I learned this from uh, someone that means a lot to me. But abundant life is always experienced in the present. Not the past, not the future. If you had it in the past, great. But when you had it in the past, it was in your present. And you will have it in the future, I'm sure. But when you have it in the future, it will be in your what? Present. So how does the thief rob you from abundant life in the present? By keeping you hanging on to anger, resentment, fears, insecurities, bitterness will rob you of the fruits of the Spirit in the present. How do you know if you have joy? There's one answer. You feel it. How do you know if you got peace in your heart? Do you feel it? How do you know if you got resentment in your heart? Do you feel it? And your brain will not let you produce fear and peace in the same moment. So if you want to let go of anger, resentment, and bitterness, forgiveness is the thing that moves you back to peace and joy. I.e., John 8, 32, freedom. Freedom. Matthew 11, the, come on me all you weak and what? Heavy laden, that doesn't mean because you're 40 pounds overweight. It's the heaviness of the heart. And what I found that pairs does for me, it not only gives me a greater sense of us-ness, it gives me a greater sense of abundant life heart. Which is really the essence of the great commandment. Walk into the God and your neighbor as your what? So do the great commandment. All the other commands fall into place. So we end up wrapping up the whole Christian uh, pairs experience with an exercise. And I will go through it with you. So I want you to picture you're all in a room. If you have a mate, you're sitting on the floor, husbands. We actually, both couples will do this, but we'll start with the men. The men sit on the floor. We turn the lights down. We play some music in the background. The wives will lay down and put their head, their, their head in their husband's lap. You're thinking, this is weird. Hang with me. You've just gone through this wonderful experience looking at your relationship. And we end on, for less, on forgiveness, and this is a closing exercise. We call it a death loss exercise. The wives are going to close their eyes and do nothing but listen and soak up the words. We, I will then read a series of sentence stems to those husbands who will then repeat the sentence stem and complete them. Now for a minute, I want you to close your eyes. Picture your mate or your, that person who's sitting with you laying next to you. Maybe put pictures on a coffin for a minute. You may not want to, but think about it. And think about what you would say as I share some of these stems. The things that I'm going to miss most about you now are the things that I wish I had told you were the regrets that I am left with are the changes that I have to make in my life to go on without you are I won't share the rest but vicariously picture yourself sharing that to that person and the whole point I use this for is is it worth not forgiving and doing the good things at the expense of losing that person and what they really mean to you. Let's go and do the good things. Because I'd hate to be left as I was when I watched my father die. And I stood there and as I watched him die, I wondered and wondered this day, did I matter? Did I, did I ever measure up? And when I watched him die February 8th, 1984, I made a decision at that point, even though I was not married, my kids will never, ever, ever have to ask that question. I will not leave them with that legacy that I was left with. They will know they were loved. And I want no regrets. And the only way I can do that well is I will follow the relationship roadmap. I will walk in abundant life. I will put pride aside. I will humble myself. I will forgive. I will ask for forgiveness because I want to do it better. I want to do it the Father's way because that is what it takes for me to walk intimately with Him as well. Comments or questions? Thank you for listening. Comments or questions? Way in the back, back there.
Okay. Do you also do that last exercise you just talked about with the reverse? Oh, yes. So you do both. Yeah, things. after they all get the tears out, the wives are like, uh, you know, <laughs> you got to have a lot of Kleenex around. But yes, we do. Yes, sir. Dave Aldridge from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, you said earlier that uh, the Holy Spirit got a hold of you when you pulled out that blue card and halfway through your wife's part, you were going, okay, that's enough. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes it's, it seems like that when you do that, it's not pretty. And it's well, kind of sloppy. But, you know, I, I, I'm hoping that, that you say that what you did wasn't a mistake because you got the ball rolling. You got it started, which I think needs to happen. Even if it wasn't perfect or the I'm not sure. topic was what are you, I'm not sure what, what I did was a mistake. I'm not sure what you're saying. Or are you just making well, you, a comment? You, you cut yourself. When she pulled out her, uh -huh. her half of the blue card, and you were saying the Holy Spirit got a hold of you halfway through, and, yep. and you felt convicted right there. I, I hope that you're not saying that you shouldn't have pulled out the card and started the process in the first place. I think no. I think what you're I'm saying, saying is I realized what I was that she was right and I was wrong. Even though you had a, a particular need for some kind of a response. Yes, because I believe that. I am to trust God for those needs. I'm not to force my wife to give them to me. And what I was doing unconsciously was trying to make her do it my way. And the greatest gift of love is when it is given, not taken. Right. But how do you articulate that need for her to... This is to where the confiding you. skills can come into play. Okay. You know, I, can, I, I can share those. New information. Hey, I noticed that uh, sometimes I come home and you don't really acknowledge me. Gee, it would really be great to have a hug. I could do that in the confiding skill through a daily temperature reading, you see. I think you're saying that it sounded like he gave up his position. Well, a little bit, but more, more than he, has a, he had a need, a genuine need. Yes, right. Yeah. right. But and, it was rat poison. And when you then, well, when then you said, well, you know, the Lord spoke to you and she was right. You know, what you're saying, you expressed a desire yes. to be acknowledged when you come home. And I think you could easily get into how important is that to you as compared to how important is it to Luella that she not interrupt what she's doing. But I don't think there, you know, she was right and you were wrong. No, it's not an issue of right and wrong. I was wrong in the way that I was trying to force her to give it to yeah. me in a certain I heard way. That. And I didn't, that's what I had to be, yeah. I, I own up I to. Think, I think I heard that part. She didn't say the need wasn't there, but she's saying is you won't let me have the freedom to love you. Right. All right, let I'm, me I'll, say I'll something. I don't think we need to go analyze that. Well, I want to say something so. about but. force. I think okay. that when we ask for what we want, we're not forcing anyone. It is her choice. Right. She got to hear what you were asking for. Right. And she could choose to say, I can do that, or I can do it sometimes, or I don't ever want to do that, but it's her choice. You were not forcing her. And I think that's mm. very important with this, because the truth is, as adults, we don't force anyone. Well, we can invite, but we yes. cannot inflict. There are pa the passive forms of fighting yeah. are ways to get our needs met, yeah. and that fits into one of them. That's what I'm saying. I realize that okay. the need was okay, but I believe that what I was doing was I was not giving her the freedom to love me, because I was, I'm a taker. I never got my needs met growing up. So you know what I did? I you take wanted, them from you. You wanted her go to take make them from you. up for it. And so I had to separate those issues out. But yeah. anyway. But you see, there's a whole other piece called power struggles. Yeah. Okay. And we're not really getting into that now, but we do. And the truth is, if she hears it as you were trying to force her to do something, and you're even saying, well, I was trying to force her. Well, it could also be heard as you are sharing what matters to you, and she's not forced. She could choose to honor it or not. Right. But it is, it could become easily a struggle of don't tell me what to do. Yeah, my philosophy about love is the essence of true love is the freedom to give. Okay. Without being taken from. Okay. It's like I tell a couple, well, I want you to go home, and I want you to do these things. I want you to give to your wife this way. Okay, I, I can do that. They come back the next week. I go, all right, Bob, did you do those things? Did you give your wife this week? Yep, I did it. Oh, great, great. How'd it go, ma'am? Well, it went great. And he goes, but she didn't respond. I go, well, I'm glad she didn't respond. But did you do those things? Yeah, I did them. But she didn't respond. I go, well, then you didn't give. You were bartering. 
Okay. That's all I'm arguing, but we don't have let to me, go there. Let me say one, one love knot. One, That's one, a love knot. A love knot. Okay. Yeah, I we wrote, don't have to go to the love knot. I wrote knots. 50 of those, and one of them says, if I tell you what I want, you, you won't do it because you resent being told what to do. Right. If I don't tell you what I want, of course you won't do it because you have no idea what I want. After a while, I myself don't know what I want. What do I want? Right. I'm confused. And we have those love knots in Christian pairs, those things that knot us up because it's, uh, there are these expectations that we have that are not based in truth. They're not based in reality. It's unhealthy thinking. Someone in the back, the gentleman back in the white. Okay. Do we have two minutes? We're out of time. We can turn the camera off and then we can stay and answer questions after that. It's just a comment, really. Um, this is a very common problem. I agree with you 100%. So what I like to do is to find what is a creative solution. And today there is no excuse for not calling ahead and saying when I'm going to be home. And that gives the wife plenty of time to prepare. And um, I always tell couples, I solution used to do, I used to brief phone, therapy. I used to phone home when I could and tell my sons that I was arriving home they would prepare it. The moment I walked through the door, the tea was prepared. They said, you go down and sit down with mum. Wow. This is your time together. That sounds very nice. And we nice. will finish like the tea. That. Yeah, and let's keep the, if you don't yeah. mind, because I don't want to go off on all, all right. that, but I'd rather keep to the program the itself. Any Let me just tell about? you, we have a website. It's called pairs.com. We also have a corner store with all kinds of things on it. And if you will stop by our exhibit booth and want us to sign anything, we will be glad to. And we really appreciate your coming today and hope you have enjoyed it. Thank you.